Okay, boxing fans, this is my review of the um, boxing uh, card called Unbreakable, the return of the IBF welterweight champion of the world, Kel Brook. Um, I'll be quite frank and honest, I'm not going to kind of sugarcoat this review. So if you're likely to get offended, I turn off this video now this boxing show this weekend was more like unbearable rather than unbreakable constant commentary from Jim Watt his legs have gone his legs have gone yeah, um, constant commentary which was biased um, at times uneducated and Really, if you're a boxing fan looking to get educated by the experience of someone like Jim Watt, you're not being educated. You just realise that Jim Watt says the same things every week. Arm punches, arm punches. You know, his legs have gone. It's reckless boxing. It's reckless boxing. See, that's all you ever hear every week from Jim Watt. What you really want to hear as a boxing fan is what's going on inside the ring. Not your personal opinion. What's going inside the ring? What do the two guys bring to the ring? You know, what sort of boxing ability? What can we expect to see from the fight? You know, not this one-sided, biased, this guy's throwing punches and the other guy who's the opponent, you know, um, it doesn't really matter. And there's a couple of examples of that. First of all, who's first on? Frankie Gavin. Look, Frankie Gavin's got lots of skills. My concern about Frankie Gavin is that... After the Bundu fight, you thought he would have got a wake-up call and said, you know what, I'm going to do something with my career. Now he's made the switch to Eddie Hearn. Frankie, I'll, I'm telling you this now, and you might not like what I've got to say, but, you know, for somebody who's got so many su such skills, you're boring the public. A lot of people are getting bored of watching you fight. And the thing is, you're now with Eddie Hearn, and Eddie Hearn will fast-track you to a beating does it look at uh, look at uh, Ricky Burns? Look at uh, Brian Rose. You look at them all. Even the guys that transfer from Frank Warren over to Eddie Hearn. I don't know one successful person who's transferred from uh, Frank Warren to Eddie Hearn been a success and stayed a success. So I think I think is Kel Brook one of them. I don't know. But what I'm trying to say is uh, Eddie Hearn has a reputation of fast-tracking people over to America and getting them beaten up. And uh, Frankie Gavin, with these sort of performances, I'm sure Eddie Hearn's probably getting bored of watching you fight um, already. And um, you, you, you can't sell no damn tickets. Nobody wants to see you fight. You've got all the skills in the world. But a guy, as you thought tonight, you should be taking him out in style. Not going 10 rounds with him. Yeah, for you, you might find it's good. But for the paying public that want to see you do something. So that's why when people say, oh, would you want to see Frankie Gavin against Kell Brook? No, thank you. Would you want to see Frankie Gavin against Amir Khan? No, thank you. Would you like to see Frankie Gavin against Keith Thurman? No, thank you. I mean, you know, Frankie, you've got to put on some sort of performance there that people are going to stand up and say, you know what? Hmm, this man's, this man's the business. You know, and yet Jim Watt's saying that their leagues are park. Part. But if you're leagues apart, then you've got to show your leagues apart. And so, you know what? Dust off this man and move on to the next mission. Move on to the next fight. This man's not in my class. He's not in my league. He doesn't need to be deserved to be in the same ring as him. But Frankie Garin's giving these guys, like, yeah, 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 you can be in the same ring as me. And we can go for 10 rounds. So, that fight, first of all, was a, was a waste of time. He's going to fight Chris Van Herden next. And Chris is going to push him. And I have interviewed Chris and... He's been he he'd been sparring with Cotto and Canelo, and he's going to give um, Frankie Gavin uh, a good fight. Frankie Gavin, of course, admittedly looks good against guys that put pressure on him. But for me, Frankie Gavin always looks like a guy who I've tweeted it out already. He always looks like a guy's got question marks about his chin. 
he's worried about getting hit. He looks like a guy that's been knocked out already in sparring and um, doesn't want to get knocked out in the ring. He just lacks a lot of self-confidence. And I just wonder why that is. Um, and a bad knockout in a gym could cause that. But he's had that for all his career. On the flip side of that, look at what Frankie Gavin achieved as an amateur and what he's doing so far as a pro. So he, Frankie Gavin remains a mystery and an enigma to me. Whether he's making the weight right is another question mark altogether. I mean, I saw him for his last fight when he was going to fight Skeet. And he looked like a, he looked awful uh, before the weigh, absolutely awful. And then obviously he rehydrated for the fight. I like that you can keep on doing that um, to your body. And I don't know, I hope we haven't seen the best of Frankie Gavin, but I'm beginning to get the feeling that that is the best we're ever going to see of Frankie Gavin. Maybe not that performance, but that's sort of standard. Okay, moving on. Uh, big fight, Adam Etches against uh, Kosminski, right, correct? Now, I'd never seen Ad Adam Etches fight before. I heard he was a big puncher. Um, but I knew Kosminski because I predicted Kosminski would have beaten um, Frank Buglioni because I didn't think Buglioni had a good defense. And I thought that Buglioni needed to learn a lot more before the fight. Buglioni got knocked out. Now, in the first round... Etches gets caught with a straight right hand, a hard straight right hand. And I tweeted out, Etches is in trouble tonight because he did not look like he could slip a, a right hand. If you can't slip a right hand, get inside inside, or get on the outside of the right hand or block the right hand. He wasn't doing that. He kept walking onto the right hand. So you could see Kuzmitsky was just tying him and waiting for that right hand. And the point of the commentator is not to keep saying, oh, Etches is looking good, Etches is throwing a good right hand, Etches is this, Etches is that. Etch what you want to be telling the fans are, look, Etches needs to be careful in this fight because kazmiski has got a nasty looking right hand, he's throwing over the top of Etches' jab. That's the sort of thing you want to be seeing when, um, or hearing in commentary. Didn't hear that. So when Etches gets laid out flat, it's because his lack of defence. You cannot come into championship boxing and start moving into world class or fringe world class with your head still and walking in straight lines. This is what happens when you feast of people, you're knocking people out of no consequence. And now you're in a fight with somebody. Now, first of all, they're hitting you back. They're hitting you back accurately. They're taking your best shots and then throwing back. This is a problem. So that's why you have to have learning fights. But in today's game, it's not happening. Promoters are trying to make quick money with fighters, and so therefore they're not getting the proper grounding that is necessary. And you saw it tonight of Etches, and that's why Etches got laid out flat. It was horrifying seeing the way Etches got laid out, but question marks. When you get laid out like that, yes, it was a good shot. Was he struggling to make the weight? I always ask questions like that. Even though he looks a solid middleweight, did he drain himself to make the middleweight division? Was it easy? Did he have problems on the scales? I don't know. Maybe he did game and come in okay. What does he live like outside the ring? That knockout was brutal. And at, at that level, getting knocked out like that, Etches will have to make some fundamental changes. Seriously, uh, his head movement, and he's, he's too straight up. So he'd have to make fundamental changes. I don't know if he's got what it takes to become a world champion or even... A European champion but what he'll have to do is take a serious look at his uh, defense ability to slip and block punches or maybe that's been taken he, he's taken that for granted because of the opponents he's been fighting now he knows you can't just walk in straight lines and uh, top of the bill on the unbearable card um, Kell Brook against Yo-Yo Dan which is what he was because uh, he just kept getting up and being put down, getting up and being put down, getting up and getting put down. Full credit to Kelbrook. Came back, looked pretty impressive. Um, couldn't miss Yo-Yo Dan with the right hand. Yes, I know it's Jojo Dan. Guys, I'm going to call him Yo-Yo Dan on this unbearable card. And just caught him with the right hand and let, didn't let him off the hook. Um, Brook wanted to impress and he looked very impressive. Um, but again, here we go. He should fight Amir Khan. Khan's ducking him. Let me ask. 
people out there one question and that includes big shot Carl Froch. Carl, question for you. You ducked Stevenson when there was a fight, an object fight with Stevenson when he was a super middleweight. Stevenson was your number one contender. You ducked him. That's why Stevenson have left you and went up to light heavyweight division and fought Dawson. But you but you won't you won't we won't talk about that. Or your number one contender, which was De Gale. We won't talk about that. And I'm sure there are other situations as well. Now you've got Andre Ward on your ass. Um, are we going to talk about that as well? And you play Mr. Big Shot? And by the way, let me remind you, Carl, that Amir Khan was uh, an Olympic, was a, a, a silver uh, medalist at the Olympics. What did you ever win at the Olympics? So, and when did you have all the belts? I think Khan had most of the belts in his hand. Uh, when he was and recognised as the number one light welterweight in the world, I believe. The number one, not number two or number three. He was recognised as number one in the light welterweight at one point. So, I don't know. Um, Khan's now training America because he feels he needs to train America. So because he's training America, that now makes him alienated from the UK? You're an idiot, Carl Froch. Absolute idiot. Why are you saying things like this? You know, and uh, while you'll uh, carry on slagging off Amir Khan, and a lot of Khan fans will probably look at me and think, oh, England's back in Amir Khan. No, you just got to say things as they are. Look at Kell Brook's last 10 opponents, or his last 13 opponents, and then look at Khan's last 13 opponents. Right? And Khan, within his own right, ha has a right to say, you know what? He, he, he's entitled to say, we, you know, he's entitled to be a bit of a big shot. In the sense that, look at the sort of crowds that Khan will draw. Look at the kind of money that Khan will attract. Brook is only chess. He just had his first title defence. And then we'll talk about, oh, fight Khan, fight Khan, fight Khan. But Khan wants to fight the big, big money fights. You know, if he's going to get in there with a Cotto, a Mayweather, a Pacquiao. I don't know about Chris Algeri. I don't know where Chris Algeri gets into it. Because Khan, just in, in that same sense, the sentence... If, if Khan could turn around and go and fight Chris Algieri, he can damn well go and fight uh, Kell Brook. That's, that's the only thing I've got in that situation. As for Kell Brook, no, I don't want to see him fight Marquez. And I said Marquez this time, not, not Marquez. I don't want to see him fight Marquez. I'd like to see him fight either Timothy Bradley or... Um, no, I don't think he should fight Keith Thurman either. Tim Bradley. Um... No, and not the winner of uh, Pacquiao and Floyd Mayweather. Because tell me, what has Kell Brook done to deserve fighting the winner of those two guys? Those two guys have fought the best of the best between light welterweight and light middleweight. They fought the best of the best between them. They've cleaned up between Pacquiao and, and, and Mayweather. How the hell does Amir Khan, uh, Amir Khan um, Kell Brook's name get into that mix? How does Kell Brook's name get into that mix, please? Explain to me. Don't get it. I don't understand. Um, I'd even see Kell Brook fight Devin Alexander. Just to see if he can get rid of Devin Alexander. And do a better job than Khan did. But it's the fight that everyone wants to see. And I understand it. But please. Give Amir Khan some credit. Brook has just come back from an injury. And... Um, I think let's see him fight somebody else. Let's see him let's see him fight somebody else at world class and world level and build his name a bit more. Let's build the fight a bit more. Make a bit more money for me. A Timothy Bradley fight would be a great fight. Uh, Brandon Rios, no, I don't want to see him fight Brandon Rios. Although it's target practice. When the fight at this this all happened, people say, Yeah, get a Brandon Rios fight. When the Brandon Rios fight is announced and people are sitting to watch the fight or just before the fight's out, uh, uh, the fight's going to happen, they say, oh, I can't, Kel will knock him out because Kel's a big welterweight. So don't, don't fight, forget Brandon Reels. We know what Brandon Reels walks in straight lines and, and uses his head and stop shots like a goalkeeper. Forget Brandon Reels. The only thing about that fight that's interesting is the fact that Brandon Reels probably, if, can't, if Brooke can knock Brandon Reels out, and the other interesting thing about that fight is if Rios can get inside and do damage because we know that Brook has got no inside game. But once he's on the outside and Brook starts landing heavy right hands, he stops 
Rios, to be honest. So, um, yep. Yeah. The unbearable card. These matchroom shows are unbelievably shocking. And you have to ask yourself the question, the amount of talent that matchroom actually have in their stable. And at this point, let me talk about Ricky Burns, who's going to fight Omar Figueroa. And Figueroa is going to just... Well, I, I don't even want to say how bad the Figueroa is going to beat um, Ricky Burns. I don't want to think about that. The fact the guy's now bankrupt. I think when Burns made the transition from Warren to Hearn, the question you've got to ask yourself, I don't know about the ins and outs of all of that. But what I do know is that when Eddie Hearn was saying about well, on, on, on TV, he was saying, oh, yes, well, we know, we, you know Burns is fully within his rights. Now he's been sued. Is Eddie Hearn going to give Burns any money back? I don't think so. And Burns is in a position now where he's having to fight for his, his career, I guess. And he's got hardly any money. It's disgusting. So, and on a final note while I'm at it, and I'm, and, 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 and I'm talking about sad situations, Audrey Harrison, everybody, anybody who knows me knows that Audrey Harrison was my classmate. Uh, at Tottenham College, I was fortunate enough to be alongside Audley on his while he was still in his amateur days, and uh, Audley asked me to take some of his boxing classes for him, and he told me to stop doing uh, cricket and get into boxing, and I guess I was slightly inspired by Audley to to box a bit, and that's what happened until the illness. So um, Audley always had the talent. Um, but uh, I will I will say this much that you know you have to be dedicated at what you do you have to be dedicated to your craft you cannot cut corners and still think you can make it to the top um, and those people talk about the BBC contract that don't know about the BBC contract and don't know what Audley went through that will eventually all come out and yeah, it will all come out, and I will tell you now that um, I think a lot of people will be surprised. Um, Audley hasn't done himself any favours in certain things he said. He uh, he said a lot of things and couldn't deliver, and that's where Audley's put himself in a lot of trouble. And you know, uh, he rubbed a lot of people up the wrong way. Um, but I guess he just wanted to be his own man, but. In hindsight, maybe he may have. All his career was going well with his former manager. The minute his former manager and him split up, that's where all he had his first loss. If you watch carefully, go back and look at his record. I could talk to you about length about this, but I'm not going to. So all he's retired now, and um, you've got to ask yourself the question: When were these brain murmur murmurings with his brain or issues with his brain? When, when did it first happen? Did it happen after the David Hay fight? Did it happen after the uh, Price fight? Or did it happen after the Deontay Wilder fight? Because again, I, I don't want to go into too much details, but um, I don't think it's just been since the Deontay Wilder fight. I don't know. Just, just a feeling. But I, I've got nothing conclusive on that yet. But um, I'm sure that eventually, at some point, uh, it's going to come out all in the wash about all his career. Well, on that point, I will leave you guys and girls. Hope you enjoyed the unbearable um, card. And uh, check out my interview with Jason Gavin, who faces um, Anthony Joshua next weekend. Okay, I'm out. Take care.